<laughs> yeah, the destination. Uh, okay, so welcome, guys. This is VFitter University podcast. We are the world's first practical university in terms of we care about simulations. We care about practicing the knowledge and uh, not only creating it. So we are here with Paul Levinson. He's an author. And um, obviously, like when you Google him, a lot of stuff pop up, which is great because I'm a great reader myself. Like I don't read, but I, I listen to audiobooks. So I'm really interested in knowing you and um, what type of content that you uh, create and um, if it's in audio form, because I'm like blind person, like I can't really read. I listen to audiobooks and it, I, I believe it's much faster when you listen to audiobooks and you can listen to it over and over again. Um, yeah, so let's start with the introduction. Sure. Well, I wear a whole bunch of hats because I don't have all mm -hmm. that much hair. So I might as well wear a lot of hats. Uh, and uh, among those many things that I do, uh, I'm a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University. I teach courses on digital media, popular culture, television, politics in the media, just about every single thing that interests me, science fiction. So getting to that, I'm also a science fiction author, and I have, I guess, seven novels published. My first novel, The Silk Code, won the Locus Award for Best First Novel. And by the way, here, let me mention that uh, I am also a great fan of audio. And some of my novels, many of my novels and some of my stories, uh, there are audio versions of it. And in fact, in some cases, it's better even than a reading. To give you just one yeah. example, I've been listening all day to the Beatles new release, Now and Then, which absolutely thrills me. I mean, it? I, yeah. I, it's, it's just magical. And mm -hmm. uh, I wrote a story and it was published way back in January 2022. Seems like a long time ago now. It's called mm -hmm. This Real Life. And it's an alternate history story. That was Real Life was the original title of John Lennon's Real Love. And uh, that story was made into a radio play. Uh, and you can, by the way, listen to the radio play for free. Uh, oh, it's wow. on a site called Kilowatt Radio. You can get an audio book of it. You, uh, and as far as its real love is concerned, the, the, the short story is also available for free, also on Amazon. And... Um, <clears throat> In addition to that, I'm pretty much finished with a short novel based on that short story. And I can guarantee everyone that one of the first things I'm going to do after the novel is finished is I'm going to see that there's an audio version of that as well, because Beautiful. I agree with you 100 uh, percent. You know, there, there is something about sound. And this is something we can talk a little more about. Uh, Marshall McLuhan, my favorite media theorist love to make the point that the acoustic world was our primary connection exactly. to the world yes. and to life. And if you think about it, I mean, I, I thought this for a long time ago, you, you close your eyes every night and you don't see anything, but there's, you don't have ear laps. Your, your ears don't automatically close. They don't close at all. In fact, you know, when you sound asleep, maybe you don't hear. But your ears, to some extent, are always in touch with the environment. And they hear things from all angles, everywhere, unexpected things. Yeah. And the brain loves processing those things. Exactly. So I'm a, I'm a big fan of audio. And I guess I'll just mention uh, last is I do a lot of scholarly work. I've got a whole bunch of scholarly books published. In fact, apropos of Marsha McLuhan, Digital McLuhan is one of my best known books around the world. Another book was New New Media. My books have been translated into 16 languages around the world, uh, including Japanese, Chinese, Polish. And I'll tell you a little secret. That's not such a big secret. I'm much better known outside of the United States. <laughs> I mean, I've noticed, but like in Beijing, 
uh, or oh, wow. Warsaw, Poland, because my books and I, the other thing that I do is music. Uh, my first album, Twice yes. Upon a Rhyme, has been reissued like half a dozen times on CD, and obviously it's on Spotify. I came out with a new album called Welcome Up, Songs of Space and Time in 2020. That's being played all over the world. So I'm a great fan of the acoustic. And, this is great. Uh, yeah, this, like, for example, since we're talking about education and audio, I feel like, yeah, I totally agree with you on that because audio is like you can transfer the tone. And this is not something you can do with uh, text. I mean, like, we invented emojis, but emojis are not like delivering the tone. And like, if the person is angry when saying this or quoting this, um, like, this is awesome. But um, if we focus on education more right now, how do you think this new artificial intelligence could really enhance education? Um, as an author, you definitely have a say on this. Well, absolutely. Let me first say, you know, a lot of professors are afraid of AI. You know, they hear chat GPT mm. and they say, oh, my God, students will use chat GPT to write their papers. And actually, here's where audio comes in. In my classes, when I assign a paper to the class, the students not only give it to me in written form, they each come up to the front of the class and they talk for a few minutes to the class about what their paper is about. So clearly they have to have written the paper to, to know in any detail what, what it's about. I think one of the main great values of AI in education is it does make research so much more effective and so much easier. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that when you do a search on Google mm -hmm. or, or Bing or any search system, what do you think is doing the search? There is an AI, there's a program there that, that does the search, and That's there is so much material in the world. More and more, of course, as time goes on. But even going back to the ancient world, but usually there's a record of that somewhere, and it's somewhere online, and AI yeah. is like the greatest thing in the world for allowing people to be in touch with that information to be educated by something you know everybody uh it's very easy to get a copy of plato's dialogues but you know there are a lot of other ancient philosophers you know who are making important points and it's getting easier and easier to access that cornucopia of wisdom and i think that's probably one of the main advantages of ai in education Exactly. As you said, like the information is very important because um, AI can access it. It can surf through Internet, lots of databases, but sometimes it can hallucinate and be over creative, if you say. Um, but like when what we do at Vifer University is that we are really focusing on practical knowledge because we believe that this is the difference between like wisdom and knowledge. Right. So when you actually make the knowledge work and you work it for so long that you you're now sure that this knowledge makes sense or it can feel uh, it can fix a specific problem um but if you think about ai right now it's being used as like chat bots or all these um like different things in the platform but what we are using it is as simulators so we let the ai test different scenarios based on like a specific parameters. Like for example, let's say in chemistry, we give up different compounds and we saw the mixture happen. We saw the whole experiments happen all in texts without having to be in danger of those chemicals. And um, sometimes labs can test only like one experiment, like when it comes to drug treatment and stuff, it takes a whole year for that lab to test that experiment. But right now with AI, we could do a hundred of those simulations all in like, all within like, I don't know, one hour. And based on that, we could then say, okay, this is like a practiced version of that knowledge and could be documented on VFitter University. So yeah, how do you see, like how, how much of the knowledge being taught in schools are pr practical right now, do you think? 
Well, no, that's a very good point. Not enough is practical. I think we do need more mm. practical knowledge. And your, your point about simulations is brilliant. As I'm sure you know, it's already been in use in medicine where doctors you know, perform and learn how to perform surgeries you, mm. through simulations. And, uh, it, you know, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, in case any of our viewers or listeners are interested in knowing, I had hip replacement surgery done about three months ago, and wow. there was an AI that was guiding the doctor. I mean, he was a good doctor, but I was told beforehand, oh, how wow. do you feel? You know, and I said, I think it's great. And uh, I'm now walking around fine. So uh, I'm not scared I, of I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. No, I'm not scared of it at all. You know, your point about hallucinations. Yeah, look, AI, like anything else, it's not perfect. And the, the way to uh, not worry so much about hallucinations is if you are asking the AI to tell you something, and then the AI tells you something, and there's something about it that doesn't quite make sense. So find another way of accessing that information. And you'll find, well, hey, it turns out the AI was right. Or maybe the other way will contradict the AI. And then you can look in yet another place. And that's how you can confirm information that you get. But again, getting back to your practical uh, knowledge point, mm -hmm. I think, especially in my field, communication and media studies, there has always been a marriage between the theoretical, understanding what impact uh, media have, but also the practical, how do you use media effectively? And I think that, uh, that AI is a very effective way of doing that. Definitely. So um, right now I would ask you this new question and then we can jump on the platform and uh, I can show you how we do it, uh, which is really interesting, like we can get give you access if you want to experiment new things, if you want to build your new simulators. Um, but how do you see this, like, for example, AI helping, like the simulator in specific, uh, helping the new startups or like the new businesses in the world? Well, the new businesses in the world are the most in need of it because if it's a new mm. business, that means they haven't been doing that before. Mm. And it's certainly a great advantage to have something that you can work out in simulation, see what the problems are, see what the advantages are, see should you do it this way or that way, and you do two simulations, and you can tell which one is better. So I would say that new businesses in fact, anything new is mm. always something that can benefit by having a simulation that you can look at on the screen before you go out into the real tangible world. Mm. Perfect. Let me let me uh, first tell you like like what we think about the whole universities and like the whole businesses concept. So we believe that university as a single organization is not capable of. Um, teaching students that practical knowledge that businesses have, right? So businesses, for example, they have a lot of the confidential stuff that they teach their workforce, the future workforce, that is not uh, being taught by universities. And we believe these businesses should have a department called university where they teach these practical knowledges and it's specific to that um, like practical use case. It's not like universities could have that and the best universities could do is to give grades and like exams which are not really practical it's like testing the theoretical knowledge with the student but why would you test the theoretical knowledge why would you not make it practical first and then teach them the practical and make like a learn and earn functionality where they learn and then they could get hired right away without the grades without the quiz um and we believe we are fixing this uh, specific issue and we're helping um, organizations focus on their return on learning as opposed to just return on investment because that's the core base of what makes revenue come like workforce that knows how to use knowledge and make specific things in the company so yeah it's like what do you think about that 
I think it's a good idea. Perfect. Okay. This is like coming from you. This is like a perfect validation for our audience, for your audience. That's um, great. So I'm going to share the screen real quick and um, just show you the, like basically what we are doing. Okay. So, do, do you see the screen clearly? Yet? I see screen share. Should I click on that? I, I mean, I don't want to share my screen. You're sharing your screen with me, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, so I, do you see I, I don't screen? see it though. Oh, you don't see it yet? No. It should be on the Zoom. Like you could go back to the meets call. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me just see where that is then. Uh, okay. Okay. I see it now. Good. Perfect. So, yeah. As you can see right now, we, we created this um, model here. It's like mm -hmm. a simulator creator. We specified goals, rules, and we give some examples that like how would the final response look like. And as you can see here, we have some variables, like for example, size and distance. And that really allows for the simulator to give, instead of one giant prompt, prompt, um, it could have like a size and distance. And then you could just do the simulation very accurately based on those variables. Um, so we specify the parameters here. We um, upload some files and assets for the simulator to have access to. Uh, we can enable integrations, add API calls, specify the method. Like for example, if it's like a getting data, if it's posting data, if it's putting, it's patching. And every credential would be automatically received by AI. Um, so all the connections would be very seamless. Um, as you can see, we have like different versions of the prompt that like the core prompt that we put in the simulator. And um, there are analytics that would let you know that like how many texts are generated by this model and we are integrated with all language models in the world now um it's like some of them are lacking in specific areas some of them are very powerful but what do you think is the most powerful large language model when it comes to simulation or have you ever even tried like all of them no, I haven't. That's interesting. So right, you want to know what I think the most, you know, if it was just one language, what it should be? Is that what your question is? What has the yeah. largest number of assets? Uh, probably English, but, you know, mm. you know, Chinese has an enormous amount uh, also. Uh, and, and maybe Spanish, you know, th those three, that's if that's what you're asking. I'm not quite sure what you mean by the largest language model. Okay, so all these large language models, like for example, let's say OpenAI created okay. GPT-4, and GPT-4 is like full of parameters, like a hundred billion parameters, and um, other large language models are competing how to make this con constitutional and uh, safe for human to use, right? So it's like it's not giving advice to how to like, you know, like uh, do evil things. But uh, right now for our simulation simulator, this is the favorite response that I want to show. Um, it's from like NASA. And um, for example, let's say we specify the destination, a planet like Earth and the deadline, like by 2056. So it gave me all the requirements for that specific uh, journey. And as you can see here, the total trip time is 35 to 50 years. <laughs> that means like it's not really that practical when it comes to like space explorations and stuff. I personally believe that we have to fix Earth first rather than going to colonizing Mars and like bringing all the resources there or start like doing uh, gardening there, you know. Um, and I believe that we are actually um, like destroying ozone by sending rockets there so it's like we're destroying earth um just to go and like surf to get the knowledge really like we, we can make things practical unless we get to that level um and like so this is one of the um experiments and okay let me, let me just say so you by language you meant computer languages not spoken languages but, but let me just say as far as what you said about space 
I agree with you only partially because I also think that we will never truly understand who we are, even what we can do to improve our planet, if, if from if all the information we get is from down here on the planet. In other words, I think the universe at large has all kinds of information that we don't even know exists because we haven't been out there. And so I wouldn't go so far as to say, and, and I understand the point you made, and, I, and a lot of you know deep philosophers have made that point, uh, that, that we have to fix Earth first before we go out there in, into the universe, into the solar system. I think we need to try to do both. You know, as difficult as that is. Yes, we have to try to continue to improve things on Earth. And we may wind up finding solutions that we didn't know even existed or barely knew existed that are out there in Mars, swirling around Jupiter. Who knows? So that's why I like to see both happening. This is interesting because when, when you say both, then we come back to the argument that like chasing two rabbits at the same time you know it's like we have to prioritize like what's best for our next move like solving politics solving climate change or like underpopulation crisis like personally until last week i did not know that we are underpopulated on earth and we thought like we're going we're really overpopulated everything is getting destroyed climate is uh under influence but it's really not like we're very underpopulated to the point that it's like a crisis and um abundance with ai and all these simulation is totally possible on this earth like everybody can own like a penthouse <laughs> and uh with all unlimited resources so in my opinion like pr the most practical um like approach here is to fix earth and make this abundance happen on earth then we could be like okay now we know all the rules on earth apart from gravity now let's go uh search all, all the like neighbor planets but it's interesting how like if we find any planet with earth conditions it's 35 years um like total trip time like a human has to accept that responsibility. And that's only if we built like a spaceship that could reach five to 20% of light speed, which we don't really have right now. So it's like by the deadline, we have to still create that spaceship. And um, yeah, so this, this simulator really helps, helped me at this point to be like, okay, like this is not really practical. And I could see that in every other uh, industry and um, specifically the ones that are testing the knowledge. And um, like, let's say we, they, ha they did a lot of research, but now they want to validate that research. Is that research useful? Let's do some simulations. Unfortunately, like the whole market right now, it's saturated with the chat bots and all these AI large language models creating videos, images. But and personally, I believe that this is the most useful thing we could do with it and fix educational um, education system, right, in, in general, um, to be able to be united and focus on the right things um, in priority. Yeah. Well, I think, I, you know, I don't disagree with that point at all. I mean, I do think that the education systems we have, they do a lot of good things, but they certainly could be improved. And I think you're right about simulation and yeah it's good to have something you know that that looks at all the variables and tells you you know we won't be able to get to a planet like earth if we apply everything that we now know until 2056 which is a long time in, into the future uh, mm -hmm. but but again i still think to me it's Here's the way I look at things in the largest possible context. Yes, you and I are here on planet Earth at this moment, mm -hmm. as is every other human being, except I don't know if there are some people in the space station. But yeah. basically, we're all here down on planet Earth. But it's clear that planet Earth is just a speck in this huge galaxy 
and, and of course, even in the much, much huger, huger universe. And there are things going on there that, you know, just common sense would say they might be very dangerous, you know, for us, or they could be very helpful to us, and, you know, all kinds of possibilities in between. So, I mean, part of the answer, which maybe you would be okay with, is, you know, we have, you know, the Hubble telescope and its successor, you know, the, the new telescope that's replaced Hubble, and we have to keep on improving those ways of looking out from planet Earth out into the cosmos. The, the successor telescope is the Webb telescope, W-E-B-B. Um, but I also think that uh, there's only so much that you can understand by looking at something that's far away. And I still want to hold open, I think there's great value in if, if we can figure out a way through technologies to, to send human beings there safely and bring them back here to Earth, I think that could open up all kinds of possibilities. Absolutely. I have to admit, that's just almost pure speculation now because we haven't gotten very far. You know, I mean, NASA since the 1960s has been talking about, you know, how, how things that they developed and invented for the astronauts help people in everyday life on earth yeah that's important but but i mean the astronauts haven't gotten too far neither have the cosmonauts neither has any other human being neither has spacex and so that's why i still am holding out hope uh and it's probably not going to happen in my lifetime but maybe it'll happen in your lifetime that we can get some human beings out there off this little pebble as wonderful and as beautiful as it can be if we can get at least a few people beyond that out there in space see what else is going on that could be enormously helpful definitely um uh, well that was like a great um conversation uh, but like we're always it's it's a pleasure to talk to you and um even have you in vifer as like a very a professional person uh, because we are trying to really like fix the education and um, we believe this is the way the practical knowledge turning knowledge into wisdom and like what's actually useful so we can then prioritize. Um, what do you think about VFitter like as a company? Well, tricky questions. <laughs> I would be interested in working with you, but uh, the other part of this that I would need to understand is when doing this. And I assume that you're also, I'm not the only person that you've approached. You've probably approached a whole bunch of other people. Um, so I guess this isn't so much a question. It's just sort of what I'm saying, you know, by way of concluding this. Feel free to contact me about anything that you might want me to be a part of. And in general, I would be very inclined to say yes if, if I had the time and, and if there was some kind of compensation for it. Uh, and I'm not saying, for example, you have to give me a million dollars <laughs> or something like that. I'm not in this for the money. Um, but, but I, uh, you know, it's the same as being a professor at Fordham. It's the same as being an author of books. Uh, I long ago realized and, and in this regard i agree with karl marx even though i i'm not you know, particularly you know believing in his total economic theory but i thought that karl marx made the very very important point that labor and capital are a really essential mechanism of our very existence uh and so you know that's the way i look at all, all the work that i do definitely definitely i would definitely be super happy to have you and um, thank you for your time. I would contact you very soon. Uh, yeah, if you have any final words for the audience. Thank you. And who's ever listening to this, I think this is an extremely exciting project. And, you know, I'm interviewed and I talk to a lot of people hundreds of times a year. 
And I have to say, this is one of the most original, intelligent conversations uh, I've ever had. So uh, I have very good feelings uh, about VFitter and what they're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you for your time. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.